In the last video that I made on Edmund Landau's Foundations of Analysis, I covered uh, the section on fractions, or at least the, the majority of the section on, on fractions. In fact, what I'm going to be going through in this video is uh, rational numbers, which in Landau's book actually forms part of uh, the section on fractions. Fractions and rational numbers are kind of lumped together in a single section, but I'm treating them uh, separately, so I'm going to concentrate on the, the rational numbers um, in, in this video. So the rational numbers are defined as follows. By rational number we mean the set of all fractions equivalent to some uh, fixed fraction. So if you remember in the, the last video um, I said that under this definition of um, equivalence, which I think was definition 8, um, forgive me if I'm, if I'm wrong on that one, then the fractions kind of naturally lump together in these equivalence classes. Well, the rational numbers are these separate equivalence classes. So the fractions, they're, they're all... So for example, we'd have... Uh, think of something like a half, uh, which is equivalent to two quarters, which is equivalent to three sixths. And there's, there's a whole uh, infinite set of fractions that are all equivalent to each other. They form a, a, a particular equivalence class, which we just call maybe a half. Um, so that's what we're thinking of here. So there's a, a very strict distinction to be made between fraction and rational number. A fraction, as we've defined it, is an ordered pair of natural numbers, whereas a rational number is an equivalence class of uh, fractions. So in everyday speech, um, we, we often use synonymously the terms rational number and fraction. Um, but here we've got to make a, a, a distinction between the, the two. A fraction is defined in one way, a rational number is defined as a, in a different way, and as it, it turns out to be a completely different thing. So we, we can't confuse the two um, at this stage. And unlike with fractions where we, we didn't have a notion of equality, we only had an, a notion of um, equivalence of fractions. With rational numbers, we actually define equality. Definition 17, equality of a rational number with another rational number um, if the two sets consist of exactly the same fractions, otherwise they're, uh, they're unequal. And uh, just a, a point to, to make here, rational numbers will be, um, for the most part at least, denoted using capital letters. So with fractions um, we tended to use lowercase letters with subscripts, um, possibly, and natural numbers using lowercase letters. Rational numbers will use strictly uppercase letters at least to a certain point. There will come a point where we'll actually break that convention, but that's that's quite far down the, the line. Theorem 78, 79, 80, um, equality of rational numbers is an equivalence relation. Um, so these theorems um, are, are so trivial that actually Landau doesn't even bother to uh, to give them any proofs, he just says that they're they're trivial, and they they kind of are um, in a way. I I agree that they're they're trivial because they they follow straight from the fact that these rational numbers are by their nature equivalence classes of uh, fractions. Uh, okay, and then the the definitions eighteen to twenty, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, and twenty one cover um, ordering of uh, the rational numbers. So x is greater than y if uh, for any fraction uh, x1 over x2 of x and any fraction y1 over y2 of y then x1 over x2 is greater than y1 over y2. So these are um, all very similar definitions, not unexpected at all, um, but they're necessary for me to, to include here. What we'll find with these uh, rational numbers is that um, a lot of the, the theorems really have corresponding theorems relating to fractions. And in fact, the proofs of a lot of the theorems for rational numbers follow straight from um, the, the proofs of the corresponding theorems relating to, to fractions. So if you take an example, uh, theorem 83 in uh, Landau, which relates to rational numbers, uh, where it says proof, it, it just literally says theorem 43, which is the corresponding proof relating to 
uh, to, to fractions. So uh, from theorem 81 to theorem, I think it's 110 or thereabouts, really the proofs uh, of the theorems just direct you straight to uh, another theorem, but a corresponding theorem relating to fractions. With the extra consideration that um, the, this proof uh, for fractions is concerning all fractions in a particular equivalence class, um, if that makes any sense. So if, we've, if we prove something for a fraction uh, x1 over x2 of x and y1 over y2 of y in fraction terms, then actually the same proof would apply to every fraction of x and every fraction of y and therefore applies directly to the to the rational number so there's not really uh, any difference in the proof so I am going to be going through this extremely quickly it's going to be 100 mile an hour that I go through this um, but in a way that's good because it allows me to get onto the more important stuff much more much more quickly what we're going to look at next is addition of rational numbers So looking now at addition of rational numbers, um, addition is defined as follows. By x plus y, um, we mean the class which contains a sum, and in fact all of the sums of a fraction from x and a fraction from, uh, from y. So x plus y is itself um, a rational number. And theorem 101 if x is greater than y, then the equation y pl uh, plus u equals x has exactly one solution u. So, um, again, we, we've kind of got this idea of uniqueness here, but here it's a more genuine kind of uniqueness in contrast to what we had with fractions. With fractions, it was uniqueness up to equivalence of fractions. Well, here we've got genuine uniqueness. This u is going to be a unique set of uh, fractions that satisfies this. Uh, the proof of this is very straightforward. Theorem 67. And that's all the proof that uh, Landau gives in his book. It is that straightforward. I've already proved this in uh, the previous video um, that I made on, on fractions. Um, so there's, there's nothing really there for me to, to elaborate on. Definition 23, the U that has been constructed as part of theorem 101 is denoted by this symbol X minus Y. Now I, I made some comments in the last video that I made um, about similar notation relating to fractions. So we had something like um, X1 over X2 minus Y1 over Y2. Um, and this was uh, a symbol used to represent the u1 over u2 constructed as part of theorem 67, for example. And I made the comment that this is really treated as uh, a single symbol. Um, obviously, it's, it's written quite suggestively um, to hint at the idea that there is a relationship between this uh, u1 over u2 and uh, these fractions x1 over x2 and y1 over y2. Similarly here, um, this is written in quite a suggestive way to hint that this u has some kind of relationship to the x and the y that are involved in uh, this theorem, in this equation, in theorem 101. But I personally, just like with fractions, I personally don't see this as uh, literally subtraction, even though it is actually called x minus y or um, the fra the rational number obtained by uh, from subtraction of y from x. I don't take that too literally and see this as a genuine operation because it's not a defined operation in the context in which we're working here. Um, obviously, intuitively, we know what it means to subtract uh, a rational number from another rational number. But in the context of the of the, uh, the the work here, subtraction is not a, a well-defined operation. There's no properties of subtraction that are um, developed, uh, presumably because it doesn't contribute anything to our ultimate goal of constructing the reals. 
So I see this as just a symbol that is, uh, we prefer to use to represent this U, um, which does drop the hint that it has something to do uh, with this X and this Y, and it's been possibly obtained in a particular way, um, but I don't see it as a genuine subtraction. So let's move now on to multiplication of uh, rational numbers. Uh, so by um, x times y, or x multiplied by y, we mean the class which contains a product, and in fact all products, of a fraction from x and a fraction of y. Uh, theorem 110, again we're back to these equations, this idea of equations. The equation y u equals x has exactly one solution, u. Uh, the proof of this, very straightforward. Theorem 77, which I proved in the, uh, the last uh, video that I made. Uh, so theorem 77 is kind of a corresponding uh, theorem relating to fractions, and this is what I'm talking about. Every, practically every theorem between theorem 81 and theorem uh, 110, including 81 and 110 in Landau's book, really has something like this as the, the proof, so that's why I'm going through this so quickly. But then we get onto theorem 111 and things start to, uh, we start to break away a little bit from that drudgery. So what theorem 111 says is that uh, if, a frac if x over 1, so we talk, we, we're talking about fractions here rather than rational numbers, x over 1 is greater than y over 1, or x over 1 is equivalent to y over 1, or x over 1 is less than y over 1, uh, this is the case if and only if x is greater than y, so here we're talking about natural numbers, x and y, x is greater than y, or x is, uh, sorry, that should be equals, x equals y, or x is less than y, respectively, and conversely. The proof of this is really straightforward. So, straight from this, I can say that uh, x times 1 is greater than y times uh, 1, so that follows from definition, uh, maybe definition 9, I think, relating to, to fractions in the last video. Well, x times 1, using um, uh, the multiplication as it's defined on the natural numbers, is just going to be the same as x is greater than y. So this is uh, an if and only if, uh, the, the logic is bi-directional, so it worked. we could have started with this and got to this and then got back to this, or we can go from this via this to, to this. Similarly, uh, x over 1 equivalent to y over 1, that means that x times 1 is equal to y times 1, which means that x equals y, and unsurprisingly, x times 1 less than y times 1 is the same as saying that x is less than y. So looking at each case separately, uh, we get that this is this is the case in each one of these. So that's theorem 111 proved. And this is significant because this leads on to uh, definition 25, which allows us to talk about uh, integers or whole numbers. So a rational number is called an integer if the set of fractions which it represents contains a fraction of the form x over 1. This is going to be uh, leading to the, a main development, a really significant development in this uh, uh, construction of the, the real numbers. So if you've, if you've been bored up to this point, just hang in there for another couple of minutes because there's going to be a big development coming up um, before the end of this, this video might be exciting for mathematicians but not for anybody else. Um, so we, we haven't spoken about integers even though again going back to our intuitive notions of fractions and rational numbers and things like that we've got this intuitive notion of integers and we kind of equate them to a certain extent with natural numbers although we've also got negative integers and things like that. They haven't actually been defined up until this point in Landau's book. This is the first time that we come across the word integer and now it's actually a defined concept. So coming back to this idea again of 
being really, really careful with how you use the information that you already know relating to your intuitive notions of rational numbers, fractions, natural numbers, etc. And being careful not to impose that uh, knowledge um, kind of prematurely onto the situation here before we've actually got to the relevant definitions or we've proved the relevant theorems. Okay, so once we've got definition 25, now we can uh, make a really significant jump, a really uh, significant development in this, in this theory, in this construction of the real numbers. So that's what we're going to look at next. So now we move on to theorem 113, which for me is uh, a massive uh, jump in the in the development, a, a significant uh, result in the development of our uh, well, ultimately what we we want to construct, which are the the real numbers. So what's going to happen here is that we're going to show that these integers that we've just defined uh, basically behave in an identical way to the natural numbers. So we're going to do that by showing that the integers satisfy all of those piano axioms, the five axioms that we originally started with for the, the natural numbers. And what this is going to allow us to do is to effectively uh, throw away the natural numbers and bring in this extended number system, which is the, the rational numbers. Uh, and within this set of rational numbers, this number system uh, called the rational numbers, we've got embedded these things called integers that behave identically to the natural numbers. So really we're not losing anything by throwing out the natural numbers, we're gaining something because we get these natural number-like uh, elements in our set of rational numbers, but also we get all of this, uh, these extra numbers as well that we've constructed, these, these rational numbers that are, so to speak, in between the integers. Uh, and from and once we've done that, then we can uh, really start to, to plough on towards um, the, the, the real numbers. We won't be able to go straight there, necessarily, but we'll, um, it will really take us um, quite a significant distance towards that, that ultimate goal. So the statement of theorem 113, the integers satisfy the five axioms of the natural numbers. If the role of 1, that's the natural number 1, is assigned to the class of 1 over 1, uh, so the, the, the rational number or the integer uh, determined by the fraction 1 over 1. And the role of the successor of the class x over 1 is assigned to the class of x prime over 1. So the class, we're talking about here rational numbers, the class x over 1, uh, the, the class of fractions determined by this fraction, which is a rational number, and the, the, uh, the class of fractions determined by this fraction which is, again, a, a rational number. In fact, there'll, there'll be integers. Okay, so how this is going to work is we're going to um, take... Uh, we're going to form a set. So this thing here. So this is roughly the symbol that Landau uses in his book. I've, For the life of me, I have no idea um, how to say this. So I'm just going to... It looks like a B, so B bar. Somebody please let me know uh, what this is. Uh, let B bar be uh, the set of integers. So now we're going to go through um, one at a time the, the axioms, the, the five axioms of the natural numbers. So if you remember the, the first axiom uh, said that 1 is a natural number. So we want to show that um, the integer 1 over 1, which corresponds to the natural number 1, uh, is going to be in this set, B bar, um, which obviously is because uh, an integer is um, a, a rational number or a class of fractions determined by uh, a fraction of this form where you've got one in the, the denominator. So if your class has a fraction in there somewhere that has a one in the denominator, then that is the, the class of fractions that belongs to is what we call an integer. So therefore, 
one over one uh, belongs to uh, weird symbol B bar, whatever it is. Okay, and second of all, we need to show that um, if you remember, the, the second axiom was that every natural number has a unique uh, successor. So we need to show that the successor of any integer, as we've uh, kind of defined it up here, is also going to be unique. So let's assume that uh, let's uh, x primed over 1 and y primed over 1, let them determine uh, classes of fractions that are both successors of um, uh, x, x over 1. So successors of x over 1. So I'm using the, the language a little bit um, carelessly here, I guess, because I'm not saying that x primed over 1 is the successor of x over 1 because that doesn't make any sense. I'm talking about the class determined by x primed over 1 is the successor of the class determined by x over 1. So just to uh, clarify any uh, issues there. Um, well, we know that um, if x primed and y primed are successors of uh, x, so here we're talking about natural numbers, then uh, x primed must be equal to y primed. So that, that follows from axiom 2 as applied to the natural numbers. Well, if x primed equals y primed, then by theorem 111 that I've just uh, proved, uh, we can conclude that x primed over 1 is equivalent to y primed over 1. So from this, we can conclude that the classes uh, of fractions determined by x primed over 1 and y primed over 1 are identical. Therefore, uh, x primed over 1 and y primed over 1 are uh, determined the same successor. So the successor of x over 1 is uh, unique. Again, I'm, I'm using the language a little bit carelessly here. The successor of uh, the class of fractions determined by x over 1 is, uh, is unique. Uh, action number 3. So action number 3, as applied to the natural numbers, said that 1 is never a successor. Um, okay, so if we know then that uh, x primed is not equal to 1, again we're talking about natural numbers here, then it follows that uh, x uh, primed over 1 is not going to be uh, not equivalent, should I say, to uh, 1 over 1. So if x primed over 1 is not equivalent, so this is uh, theorem, again theorem 111, x prime over 1 is not equivalent to 1 over 1, then um, they, they don't determine the same class of fractions. So x prime over 1, uh, sorry, 1 over 1, the, the class determined by 1 over 1 is never a successor of, of any integer. So axiom 4, as applied to natural numbers, said that if x prime equals y prime, then x equals uh, y. So let's say that uh, x primed over 1 and uh, or the class determined by x primed over 1 and y primed over 1 uh, coincide. So the, the classes determined by these uh, coincide. Then uh, x primed over 1 is equivalent to y primed over 1. But using theorem 111, it's coming useful. Is that is that theorem? We can say that uh, x primed must be equal to uh, y primed. So that this follows from here. But now we're, we're back to natural numbers. So we can just apply 
uh, axiom 4 to these natural numbers. So from this we conclude that x equals y and therefore x over 1 uh, is similar to y over 1 again in application of uh, theorem 111. So therefore we've effectively got the, the statement of uh, axiom 4 now applied to, to the integers. And finally axiom 5 which if you remember is the uh, axiom of induction so what we're going to do is we're going to construct the set uh, M bar is the set of all uh, set of integers such that Uh, a 1 over 1 belongs to M bar and B uh, if the class so if the class uh, X over 1 belongs to M bar then um, uh, x primed over 1. So again, the, the class determined by x primed over 1 uh, belongs to m bar. Now let uh, m, just m without the bar, be the set of natural numbers. x for which uh, x over 1 is in m bar. So clearly uh, 1 uh, belongs to m uh, because 1 over 1 belongs to m bar and uh, if x belongs to m that can only be uh, if either x is equal to 1 or if not then um, x, uh, it means that x over 1 belongs to m bar and if x over 1 belongs to m bar then x primed over 1 belongs to m bar and, and therefore um, x bar, x prime, sorry, uh, belongs to m. So the conclusion is these satisfy um, the conditions of axiom 5 as applied to the natural numbers, so therefore m is uh, the set of natural numbers. And it follows then that M bar is the set of integers. When I say the set of integers, I mean the set of all integers. So therefore, if M bar is a set uh, that satisfies these two conditions, then M bar is the set of all integers, which is exactly the, the statement of uh, axiom 5 uh, as applied now to the integers. So we've got all five axioms satisfied, uh, all five piano axioms satisfied by these uh, integers. So for what it's worth now, we may as well get rid of the natural numbers, bring in this new system of numbers, the rational numbers, which we know embedded in there are these integers that behave exactly like those natural numbers that we've just thrown away. So we make a big gain here. Um, we get an extended number system and it's this extended number system of rational numbers that's going to allow us to really press forward um, with our construction of the real numbers which the, the natural numbers themselves 
are going to, I guess, be insufficient. Where the, the rational numbers, because we've got all this extra material now to work with, so to speak, um, it allows us to do allows us to do a lot more uh, stuff and allows us, like I said, to press ahead towards this goal of constructing the real numbers. So I've got a little bit more to say about this, um, which I'm going to move on to now. So just a few last little things to, to say regarding rational numbers and then I'm going to be wrapping up this video. So this is really the, the home straight now for, for rational numbers. So we've, um, we've just got rid of the natural numbers, brought in the integers and with them the, the, the rational numbers. So what used to be used to denote the, um, the, the natural numbers, we're going to change the meaning of that now uh, and that's uh, through this definition 26. The symbol lowercase x, which uh, used to stand for the natural number x, we're actually now going to uh, use that to, to denote the class determined by the fraction x over 1. In other words, the integer um, that's determined by this uh, x over 1, this fraction x over 1. So this now is going to be considered as an integer and hence a, a rational number as well. So this is where it can get a little bit confusing if you are kind of skim reading Landau. You're not necessarily reading it uh, line for line and really carefully because you can get to something like theorem 114 um, and it's, which says if z is the rational number corresponding to this fraction x over y then y times z is equal to x. This would appear um, it, like I say, if you were skim reading, that you multiply uh, the natural number y by the rational number z to get another natural number x. That's definitely not the case. There is no multiplication defined between natural numbers and uh, rational numbers, at least not in, in Landau's book. I'm not saying it can't be done, but uh, it's not done here. We don't have such a, a concept. Uh, the notation has changed. So now, um, in line with, with definition 26, so now this y here is talking about the integer y, in other words, the rational number, and therefore this multiplication, y times z, is actually multiplication between two rational numbers now. And similarly, this x is an integer, stands for an integer, which again is a rational number. Um, so we're getting two, these two rational numbers multiplied together will be equal to, to this rational number. And multiplication between rational numbers is a defined concept for us. The, um, another source of confusion, I guess, here is uh, the x and the y here. Um, actually, this, these are natural numbers. This is the last time, really, that um, fractions and natural numbers make it an explicit um, appearance. Uh, in Landau's work. So here we're talking about the fraction x over y, where x and y here in, to be interpreted as natural numbers x and y, whereas here we're interpreting the x and the y as uh, integers and or rational numbers. So I'll just quickly run through the, the proof of this. Uh, it's nothing too difficult. Um, so y, the integer y is determined by um, the class uh, of equivalent fractions to the fraction y over 1. z is determined by the fraction x over y. So we've got, we, we've got a concept of multiplication of, of fractions, so let's do that. Uh, in fact, so that should be equivalent to, not equal to, equivalent to um, y, x, over 1 times y, which is equivalent to using commutativity up here, uh, we get xy over 1 times y, and that's equivalent to x over 1. Okay, and the fraction x over 1 determines the, uh, the class x. So that's uh, theorem 114 proof. So it's a, a really simple, straightforward proof. Definition 27 says that the U of uh, theorem 110, so um, that was to do with equations. So the equation 
uh, y times u equals x, for example, the solution to that equation we're going to denote by this symbol x over y. So this is the rational number obtained by uh, the division of x by the rational number y. Uh, so a consequence of this is going to be that y times uh, x over y is equal to x, which uh, you might say, well, surely that's obvious that y times x over y equals x. I'd argue that it's not obvious because there are similar health warnings that apply to this as to, uh, for example, x minus y, uh, as, as I've introduced earlier. The division here is, th this is just a symbol. Uh, we say x divided by y, but division is not a, a, a genuine, honest um, operation um, in the context of, of what we're doing. This is just a symbol that we're using to represent that particular uh, rational number. So, okay, it's written quite suggestively to hint um, that there is a, a relationship between it and these other numbers that it's kind of been obtained from, but that doesn't automatically mean that y times x over y is gonna be equal to, to x. It happens that that is the case, uh, but it's not an automatic uh, thing. Um, it's not uh, something that we can just take for granted. Um, okay, and then a final note, um, which is not, it's not presented as a, a theorem, it's actually just kind of um, bundled in with definition 27 in Landau's book, but I'm gonna present it as a separate note. Every rational number can be written in the form x over y. Here, x and y, are to be interpreted as being um, integers, not uh, not natural numbers. So they're definitely meaning integers. Um, so this is this is not at all um, again obvious necessarily. Um, okay, we know from our intuitive. I keep going back to that. Our intuitive understanding of these number systems. Um, but intuitively we we know that a rational number is a number that can be written in the form uh, a over b where a and b are integers and b is not equal to zero and things like that uh, so this seems like it should be a sensible thing to to say but it's again it's it's not immediate it's not something that we can just take for granted but let's have a look at how this uh this comes about um well, the fraction, so I'm going to be jumping in and out of different notations here, um, but I'll try and make it as, as clear as possible. So the fraction x over y determines, uh, it determines a rational number uh, z. Okay. And, okay, the... Um, so that means that this z is this effectively the same z that we were talking about up here, up here in theorem 114. So from this we can say then that uh, y z is equal to x. So this is theorem 114 that allows me to say that. But the solution to this equation is denoted um, x over y in accordance with definition 27. So remember that the x and the y here are rational numbers. Well, according to theorem 110, the solution to such an equation, this, uh, this u, in other words, is unique. Um, so therefore, if x, if this is a solution to this equation, and z is a solution to this equation, the conclusion is that z is equal to x over y. So here, this x over y here is referring to the rational number uh, x over y, x and y being interpreted as integers, 
but z was the uh, rational number that was determined by the fraction x over y. So this kind of shows that every rational number can be written as uh, written in this form as an integer divided by uh, another integer. So again, intuitively, it's not really any surprise, but it is something that's got to be really proved. We can't take it for, for granted. And that wraps things up for uh, rational numbers. There are a couple of other theorems kind of tagged on the end in, in Landau's book that I'm, I'm not going to go through. Uh, I'm going to leave it there. I think that's a, a convenient place to, to finish. So that's everything for, for rational numbers. Uh, there's going to be another video that I'm going to be making shortly on the next section. Um, but thank you for watching this video and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.